three. All right, guys, welcome back to the Fitness in Philosophy podcast. My name is Robbie Gustin, and I'm joined, as always, by James Fitzgerald. James, how are you doing today? I am good. I'm going to request that from here on, you have a slightly different introduction on your first question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you got to change up, how are you doing today, uh, to 80 different versions. It's going to have to change. Uh, okay. Oh, what what's up? That'll be the next one. And then another time it's like, Hey buddy. <laughs> um, I was thinking about throwing a, uh, a wild card in the works. Hey, we, the, we, the, the election just took place when we're recording this. What do you think of the election? But I'll, I think, well, I think I'll, we just had that discussion and, uh, that could definitely take us down a rabbit hole. Yeah, no, that could be, that would be timely. Um, well, we hope everyone is, uh, is happy and, and listening out there. Yep. I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. Uh, what episode number are we at now? Are we into 20 yet? Uh, we are at 15. Okay, we're done. Um, but speaking of new episode intros, I, I did think of something that might not be uh, a bad idea, assuming you're uh, cool with it. Uh, if you guys have been liking this podcast, uh, go give us a review. Yeah. We really enjoyed doing it, and uh, we'd love to hear what you think. So on your favorite podcast platform, just... Uh, let us know what you're thinking. Yeah. Yeah. You're well, cool. unless it's a poor review and then don't go there. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> if it's good, please review us. If it's not, you know what? Just don't do anything. Yeah, just stop. Some things are better left untexted. Um, <laughs> <I'm sad. laughs> um, I'd also, uh, we, ha we have some surprising stuff coming up in the future. We're going to have a Patreon uh, page uh, where you can donate uh, funds to... Uh, to us because you know because we need money um no i'm joking it's just the typical thing you just hear from I, I don't know if you find that humorous as well but it seems like you know how is it possible to get to t get like ten thousand people who have podcast listeners that are all listening to those podcasts that actually have funds that are dedicated to those people how and i don't know what the money does on the back end so is it is it to uh, put cereal on their children's table or to buy a mic? Or I'm not even sure what, where does that go? What's that for? And sure. are we paying for information? Anyways. We should have a Patreon to investigate that. <laughs> Just set up a, <laughs> a committee to investigate what is going on with all these podcasters <laughs> raising that's all this money. That's what you're sponsored by today. <laughs> Your sponsor is VPN and a private investigator called uh, yeah. Johnny. Uh, no, first name only, but he's going to go out and figure out where all that Patreon money is actually going once you pay us, because then we'll be able to afford to pay Johnny. Can you imagine if we started doing like, I think I've seen Ben Shapiro. I've, I've seen some other folks like occasionally, like they'll, they'll turn the camera and like, you know, uh, Go sign up for Wattify. Go sign up for Rom. Can you imagine if we did that on this podcast? Dude, I am. Listen, I ironically, am, I am coffeeed up and ready for that. I could listen. I've listened to Shapiro, and I could nail that. It, it's it goes something like this. Uh, Robbie, I got a question for you. But before I get to that question, I want to tell you about something. <laughs> Quip toothbrushes. Have you ever had something stuck in your tooth? <laughs> listen. I can pull out all the fitness variables uh, the, from the eight pound pink dumbbell sponsorship to the light blue band seated low row movement uh, program design, nine ninety nine dollars per month sponsorship. Pro Listen, I can pull those puppies out. So if at any time I feel from here forward that we want to place sponsors inside uh, and roll through it, I will do so. I heard that uh, OPEX may have a gain pain and sustain coffee. Oh, <laughs> you to start it out. Ooh, you just let it out. You just let the cat out of the bag. Never understood the cat out of the bag. It's kind of um, kind of crazy. People would put cats in bags. I mean, people who love cats are. Have you ever thought of that? Anyways, so uh, yeah, we're going to. Uh, we have uh, with OPEX Franklin and Tara and Dennis Cheatham. Uh, they have their own roasting um and uh, they make their own coffee uh also it has a really great story behind it so we wanted to partner up with them 
so that OPEX could possibly be used as a little booster to not only their product, but to share amongst our family uh, of OPEX gyms and all of our OPEX culture. Um, and ironically, there's three different kinds of blends and we could change it based upon gain, pain and sustain uh, for that. So yeah, we're excited about that. That's cool. Yeah, we're sorry if I let the cat on the back. I, I saw Carl post about it the other day, so I didn't, Yeah, yeah I, no. I figured it was. Yeah. No, I meant for today. It was supposed to be my surprise. You just took my uh, oh, I'm sorry. My, my sponsorship bit. You know, in ten minutes, I was just going to uh, start off. You know, are you tired at times? <laughs> Before we get to the next question, um, are you I think we just had our first official one right there. Hey, there it was. You know, these sometimes feel a little tired. Well, I do too. So we'd like to. Um, yeah, we have that uh, coming out, and uh, um, we don't have cats coming out of bags, and uh, we're we're excited to uh, uh, to be doing that. That's cool. Yeah. But we could also certainly do parody ones for things like the pink, the pink weight, or you know. Oh yeah. Different oh. different uh, stretchy bands or. Oh, for sure. <clears throat> For sure. I thought the, the video you and Carl did the other day was pretty funny, so I enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah. All right, guys. So today we're going to talk about dogmatism and a little bit about skepticism. Yeah. Next episode will be skepticism, but today we're going to talk about dogmatism mostly. So uh, those of you who've been listening know that we typically do episodes and couplets, although not exclusively. Um, and this may change up in the future, but if you're just listening, yeah, we typically do a couple episode pair of topics that tend to go together. And for the next couple episodes, we're going to focus on two different um, ways of relating to one's beliefs. So these are dogmatism and skepticism. So let's talk briefly about like what these are and um, what we're going to talk about. So uh, dogmatism and skepticism, broadly speaking, are epistemological approaches or attitudes that one can adopt towards what we know or what we believe. And epistemological, for those who may not have heard that term and not be familiar, it's just a fancy way of saying the study of belief or knowledge or justification uh, or truth, just everything having to do with how we know or believe about the world. That's what that study is about. So one could say that these are not just any two positions on the status of what we know, but rather that they are two diametrically opposed positions on either side of a spectrum, or at least the super hardened calcified versions of them of them are. So going back to that visual seesaw metaphor that we had with Aristotle, where we, you know, Aristotle was saying that virtue is a mean in between two extremes, both of which are vices, we could say that dogmatism is a vice of excess, meaning that you believe too much in what you believe in. Um, skepticism is a vice of deficiency. You don't give enough credence to things you have evidence for. And proper belief, I don't know that there's actually like a single term for it, but proper belief is the virtue in between these two vices. It's where you would give credence to things you have good evidence for and not good credence to things you don't have evidence for. Do aliens exist? I don't know, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Do you know what I mean? Like, but there, there are certain things we know and certain things we don't. And from a historical perspective, Kant famously argued, um, uh, probably, probably the most famous philosopher I can think of that argued that his entire system, which is you know gigantic in the canon of Western philosophy, was meant to um, toe a middle line between dogmatism, which he equated with early modern rationalists like Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza and uh, early modern empiricism from people like uh, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. So that's kind of a little intro on dogmatism and skepticism. Uh, didn't know if you had any thoughts, comments, any, anything there? No, I just look forward to, um, to thinking about uh, how dogmatism uh, can be in place in fitness. Um, and uh, what do we have to just be cautious of uh, when we recognize that is in place or we recognize that is there. And then I think I did see it in your notes that we'll talk about anyways, but I just brought up a thought about it, um, is getting to the point where we can see some, so the, 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 what the characteristic definition is of dogmatism, how, how a portion of that definition could actually in some cases be positive. Um, 
And the reason why I think there is a place for that indirectly, whether you call it dogmas or not, maybe you might have a different definition for it inside of fitness is that um, it's, we're really hard from, we're really far from uh, what we deem to be uh, truthful and truth in terms of fitness practices. Um, Like we talked about on our previous podcast, it's like, there's, there's some things we think could be true, but you know, the evidence and what goes on, we just don't really have a grasp of what the definition is. So we can't find what truth is. Um, so that, um, and I do look forward to the idea around uh, falling in love with the mystery that, that we just don't know. We don't know about a lot of things within fitness. And I, I do like that area as much as I may not seem to like that area because I want to be right a lot. Um, I love the aspect of not knowing a whole bunch of different things. And uh, maybe we could, uh, maybe at the end, um, individuals can see that even asking that question with inside of fitness around the mystery of things can open you up to a whole bunch of things outside of fitness to understanding uh, the unknowns and being okay with that. So that's what I just was just thinking about as soon as you started the, to define it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are good points. And a couple of things come to mind as you said that one would be, um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this. We don't want to be dogmatic about dogmatism, right? Like, so the, the, the standard line on this that we'll talk about, of course, is that, uh, you know, dogmatism, generally speaking, isn't, isn't a great thing. Uh, it leads to lots of really gnarly things. But to your point, getting deeper about what do we mean by dogmatism? It, it, it can't just be like, firmly believing what you have good evidence for that that doesn't seem to be a bad thing yeah. and maybe in the context of fitness like you were mentioning we're in such a realm of like you know this camp over there and that camp over there and these like mm-hmm. silos and you know maybe gets maybe getting some points up on the board about like hey we have good evidence for these and we should you know shout them from the rooftops to kind of like get the ball rolling might might some version of that whether we call it dogmatism or not um but just things we have uh, good evidence for that we should have firm beliefs and be, be warranted in a certain context. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's a host of them, I think inside of fitness that we may, uh, we may be aware of that, um, that fall into that category, as I said, of possibly being dogmatic, but not, and could be positive, <laughs> positive influences, right. That, uh, we, but we still don't know that number one, it is dogmatic. And number two, that it could lead to some possible positives. We just don't know. Right. Yeah. Based upon experiences and, and whatnot. So, yeah. <clears throat> so looking forward to if we touch a little bit on that and, um, and yeah, you offer a, a, a good definition of it and you brought up a couple of names there. Could you probably give um, maybe I'm just thinking at this time, it might be good for you to do that, Robbie, if you can pull it out. Um, you know, uh, um, this is greedy for me, but it helps me understand it more. Um, what could be some, you know, what could be a dogmatic uh, statement um, historically uh, through, and I think you may have had it in your notes that you give different areas that have yeah. that, and then that may cover it, but I was just thinking like in the 1600s, you know, or enlightenment period, 1700s, you know, what was a dogmatic statement then? And then what could have been a dogmatic statement in 1942 in Germany? And then what's a dogmatic statement today? You know, and I think you may cover that with some of the things you're talking about in different arenas, but care to care to uh, jump on that one for what the dogmatic statement could be. So people could uh, see what we mean by that across multiple different cultures and Yeah. I mean, it, and it's, it's a good question. And it, it, a lot of it depends on, in what sense we mean dogmatic? Do we mean dogmatic in relation to that particular time and place or do we mean dogmatic now yeah. in, in reverse? Yeah. yeah, no, in that time and place, because I think in time and place, yeah. it allows us to open our eyes to that having a part to play in the definition of it being a dogmatic statement. So that's why I was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, uh, famously in, um, you know, the Inquisition and things like that, um, Although, you know, this, this is again where you run into issues. There are a great number of people who didn't view it as dogmatic. So, um, but, you know, um, if you uh, don't believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should be driven out of, you know, uh, 
Spain, Portugal, uh, mm -hmm. that would be uh, one instance, of course, in uh, America, uh, famously, you know, uh, certain races, in particular African Americans, were, you know, not considered worthy to, um, to vote. Same thing with uh, women. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, I mean, I, I feel like one of the hallmark features of dogmatism that you run into in these different times is when you, when you, when you push on it, you get two different things happening. One is people have a hard time giving a reason besides like, just because yeah, like, you know, mm -hmm. the government says so, or my parents say so, or the church says so, or what have you. And then the second is the emotional bit of like the, the vehement resistance, the, <laughs> it, it's not just one among other things like, you know, it's, I guess quasi dogmatic to only eat popcorn at movie theaters. <laughs> but no one, no one cares enough. About, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, I guess it's nice, but it doesn't doesn't make that much of a difference. But for certain things where it's like that 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 visceral reaction. Yeah. Um, so those are a couple that I can. Those are great. Um, yeah. No, that, that's super helpful because I think you mentioned something in there that I wasn't you know I wasn't uh, laying out for you to to set it up for me, but um, it allows people to recognize you know. Um, uh, time and experience and practice, um, you know, um, this is why you'll get into em empiricism and, and the pluses and minuses of that, that can, that can really create some validity to it being dogma, dogma or not. Right. So to your point, which I heard very clearly, but it was, it was ironically the same prophesizing that was done in the early aughts around high intense exercise right so discussing it at the time for some specific people were persecuted or vilified right and pushed really hard uh and uh, and then now over time what you're getting is how you're describing it this very visceral reaction because there's so much built inside of like well why are you doing intense activity they're like because we were told to i mean that's stupid you're asking that question right so it's ironic that even in fitness, not irony, I guess, but I didn't set it up for us to cover that, but that was just helpful for me. I, I like, I like spending time trying to connect myself to how time and experiences and how people have navigated on this thing for so long that usually like drives up principles for me. So that's why I appreciate going through a timeline. Um, you know, like, we, I'm not asking to just first do this, just to pause for a second, but you know, there, there was a time where a lot of people thought that women shouldn't vote. <laughs> like, I know I, I'm, I'm like, and you know, hope you know why I'm laughing. Uh, but it's like, that was a, a, like a real, real thought, real. I mean, capital R real thought, you know? Uh, so it's and only a couple of generations removed too, Dude. like, we're not, we're not, we're not talking massive amounts of generations either. Oh, we could come up with, we can load up a number, number of different examples of, you know, psychological texts uh, 40 years ago saying, if you're gay, it's a, it's a psychological disorder. So um, we, you know, anyways, it, it's important to go through that though. Like I do with the fitness journey, right? Like I make the jokes of there was never was a leg press for like a long period of time, but it, uh, cause it, it helps you connect to, you know, what's in front of you and what's real. And so I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I think, you know, to your point there, there's a very interesting, interesting sociology and history to dogmatism. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, Jesus was originally the rebel, do you know what I mean? And then the stuff becomes calcified. And if you don't believe this, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, and but it's the same thing in, 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 in CrossFit uh, where, you know, it's like, well, we're railing against bodybuilding and, you know, long, slow distance. And then that's the, that's the flag we're flying. And then it becomes hyper calcified and how, you know, how dare you do a curl and a bend, you know, you know what I mean? Like it gets yeah. super, super, super calcified. So I think the, that happens sadly more often than not, but there are movements that, you know, are able to uh, avoid it. And maybe we'll discuss this later, but I, I it, it's always seemed to me, um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts here either now or later, but, um, you know, I, I started doing CrossFit around 2010. So obviously you were in it for a lot longer than I was, but, um, and 
you know, became aware of Rob Wolf and Paleo and all the rest of that stuff. One movement seemed to me to become far more dogmatic, namely CrossFit. Yeah. Uh, and one, you know, th there was stuff, there was stuff, you know, like th there are definitely dogmatic principles, but I, I saw, you know, Rob and others were very anti-dogmatic in their nature. Like they're like, well, we once thought legumes, dairy, and, you know, these grains weren't so great, but, you know, upon new research, like we're revising things. So I guess I'm just bringing that up all by way of saying that, like, just like we were talking about earlier before the call, like, it's a very special thing when you can have a movement that tries to resist that and you can't always control all different people. And it's not a foregone conclusion that things will lead to dogmatism, but this very often can happen where something starts out as a rebellious faction. And then, you know, they're like, you know, question everything, but then, but don't question my stuff at the end. Yeah. And then, but there are movements that through critical thinking, I, I've found paleo to me seems to be at least one again, not saying that there aren't any dogmatic elements in there, but, um, it's interesting how some movements have been able to resist that and some have not within the health yeah. and fitness space. So. Yeah. And that, yeah, it, uh, yeah. And hopefully we'll, we'll chat on that a little bit is that, you know, in, in terms of <clears throat> making a dent and having fitness impact and how we do it through coaching and a business, you know, <clears throat> this where I'm saying that that kind of concept of like, I am, I am right. And this is best for you. Uh, we just don't have the system set up to like spend all the time, like getting people to be critical thinkers for 10 years to figure out in the end that they can do in their own patterns of exercise. You know what I'm saying? Like, so this is where in, in fitness, it's kind of tough. And I listen, I, I respect whenever, whenever, whenever someone is, I guess it moves into then like a militant or authoritarian concept of like, you know, no, in here we, we bend and squat and bench and we fucking do flywheel bike and shut the fuck up like that that's what we do you know so you can see that behind it they're just like I, i'm not willing to take the time <laughs> to to you in 12 years to come back being like listen i i realize these patterns are important in aerobic activity <laughs> it's like you know so they're just like so that's my point is that is that a dogmatic you know uh, principle right um, and I think where it went wrong, which that's why I love the aspect of getting inside of fitness and realizing it over time, the social experiment of intense fitness for 20 years has shown that, is that time will show you that, um, you know, that the veil was pulled um, and it, it uh, came from intentions that were not based upon, you know, everyone moving. It wasn't that. We, we think it was, but we now know that it wasn't that based upon their lack of, and I'm pointing fingers here, their lack of, of evolution, to your point. You know, they, it went to that hard direction, Robbie, and you made an intricate point there of uh, Rob Wolf, you gotta connect to the Black Box Summit. That was the point. Yeah. That was the intersection where they could have very well said, you know what? There is a slightly different way that's slightly different than the doctrine that we need to revamp. We need to stick to our guns, which originally said, <clears throat> listen, if it's better, we're open to it. We said, here's how we need to be open to this thing. And then that was met with like, that's not going to work. So that's the proof that the dogmatic concept was actually on incorrect intentions because it created that visceral reaction and they didn't want to, let's quote unquote, call it evolve from it, right? Yeah. And it led to, you know, as you know, affiliates and commercialization and treadmills inside of gyms, treadmills meaning just a turnstile, measuring square, you know, square footage versus overhead business, you know, that's where it, uh, that's where it went, so. Yeah, yeah, I agreed. So we just but tied yeah. in, you know, some of the things, you know, we fast tracked there a little bit, but, uh, I'm interested, yeah. Robbie, for you to discuss, uh, um, you know, some how in different cultures and uh, religion and and science and politics sure. and uh, where that sits, because uh, that's that's really helpful. Yeah, definitely. So let's let's first just give a definition of of dogmatism. And if you look it up in the dictionary, you'll see a couple different things, some of which are relevant to what we're discussing today, but one of which seems to be the most relevant to what we're particularly discussing today, which is 
the character of being dogmatic, authoritative, positive, or arrogant assertion of doctrines or opinions. So what are some famous types or examples of this? So religious, um, you know, and now again, I don't mean to suggest that this is characteristic of all religion. Uh, they're all, even within particular religions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism, they're all sorts of more um, open sects and more close, you know what I mean? Like there, there's a whole flavor, but generally speaking, if you look sociologically at this phenomenon, there's generally the said sects, S-E-C-T-S. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> exactly. I have to clarify that. Although, you know what? Hey, if someone wants to go down that rabbit hole, they can, hey, hey. you do you. Mm -hmm. um, so in the religious sphere, anyone who fails to believe is a heretic, sinner, or is going to hell, right? It's not it's not just that they're wrong. Again, going back to this notion of a visceral reaction, um, you know, if someone thinks my car is blue and it's silver, well, they're wrong, but I don't think they're going to hell. Mm -hmm. um, but this notion that if you reject certain things, you are inherently bad and something bad will befall you. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the political realm, uh, a politician who thinks everything he says is right and anyone who disagrees with him is an idiot or out to get him. Sound familiar? Uh, in the philosophical world, those who think uh, one thinker is the way, the light, and the truth. And again, you see this with all things. I mean, Kant, who I studied, um, I mean, I studied lots of others too, but that was the main guy who I wrote my dissertation on. Uh, you know, he, he, was a, he was a system breaker and a system builder. He, he, he tore down all these other um, systems of philosophy in a, in a certain way, but he also built new ones. And then after him, people came along and said, you know, some of them said Kant is the way, the light, and the truth. You know what I mean? You get that phenomena where yeah. it's like, no, this, this guy's a cool thinker. Uh -huh. We like him, uh -huh. but you know what I mean? he's, not, he's not the way, the light, and the truth. Um, in the scientific instance, there are people who, you know, wouldn't believe in germ theory or quantum mechanics. Uh, famously in the health space, uh, the people who won the Nobel Prize for showing that ulcers are caused by uh, H. pylori primarily. Mm -hmm. um, they were, I think, famously laughed off stage uh, initially. And then, you know, in the fitness space, like we were talking about, you know, CrossFit to a certain extent. And then there were different apologists that were on staff that would literally go on like Twitter and like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, you know, and uh, do you remember, uh, you remember Epic Beast Mode and uh, Drywall? <laughs> you know, and they were like, they're just, you know, having fun talking about CrossFit and like their stuff got torn down. So things like that, things, the sociological phenomenon of like, you can't make jokes anymore. You can't have fun. Like, this is too serious. Like, we're going to tear you down because you're questioning what we believe. That, that phenomena. Yeah. So. Yeah. JP Sears should have continued in inside of fitness. He went... <laughs> He went deeper in other areas and he should have just stayed in the fitness lane. I mean, he, he had work for 50 years um, inside fitness. So much he could have done. Just wait for a new trend and then just like work with it for three months on that. They're just so good. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> I'm glad you gave some of those examples. Um, um, yeah, I just think they're super timely. Um, and uh, somewhat uh, uncomfortable for I would I would say for a lot of people because they they really didn't even they may not have even seen and this is the important thing that each listener can do is to is to look at look at yourself and your perceptions of each of those areas right um, and even if your competency level is not high enough or your experience in each of those levels don't know this just ask those questions right like what what do I believe to be true that I'm like I'm standing back on, like standing firm ground on and uh, have thoughts in each of those areas. And that at least allows us to understand, you know, when it moves off into an area that can't be, you know, uh, can't be changed. Um, and it takes all of us to see that within ourselves. So thanks for going through each of those particular areas for that. Um, yeah, no problem. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really good point. I think, you know, one of the things that mindfulness and other meditative practices ask us to do, and it, it's hard, mm -hmm. it's hard is, you know, call awareness to what are those beliefs that if someone called them out, like you would have the, I'm gonna rise up and fight. Uh, and, you know, and some of those are good. Some mm -hmm. of those are good. We should rise up and fight for, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, equal rights and things of that nature. But then there are other things like, 
I should only be doing intense exercise. And just like, what, what are those things that are causing that visceral reaction in you? Yeah. And, um, you know, just that awareness, I think is beneficial. Yeah, it is. Um, cause sometimes, uh, you may not even recognize that that's caused by, uh, you wanting to fit in, you know, like you want to be, you feel that you're pertinent and you are the center of the universe and what you do matters. And you may not see that uh, no one actually cares if you do participate in intense physical activity or not. So you may be doing that because you think you're a part of what's important. And if you, if that's pulled away from you with just, just the thought around it being possibly not that important, then your whole thing dissolves, you know? And that's where I think a large majority of people are really afraid to take those steps, right? To do meditation and contemplation, just sit back and go, like, I'm okay with the fact that I'm still doing hard shit, but, but why am I, why do I really get like jazzed up when someone either wants to take that away from me in thought, like just say, why, like, what have you thought about that? Like, what's the, so hopefully that's the, that's the end result in our podcast, as well as just the topic in general is for people to, to see where they are in that place and how they see those things um, that could help them. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where the sociological element, I think, is so important because 40 years ago, someone doing, you know, high intensity functional training would not be part of any tribe aside from the cuckoo. You know what I mean? Just like out, out there, wouldn't have the Instagram following, but now yeah. they do it and they post. And uh, I mean, not everyone, of course, but, you know, people with 10,000 followers plus in the swipe up feature, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're part of the tribe. And um, so just, just that sociological element of like what it's not just the belief. It's not just the visceral reaction. It can also be that, that group think yes. element. Yes. To it, so, which is a, which is a, I think is a bigger part of a, a lack of awareness, right? Right. Yeah. It's less about the, uh, just, you know, that actually, cause it, it should make sense to us, you know, as to, as we communicate and create tribes and communities and feel like we want to be a part of something. Um, like the, the Facebook experiment, right? The original intentions kind of seemed good, right? <laughs> um, but now connection is like weird, you know? <laughs> yeah. Connection and social is weird. And so that, that's a, it's a, it's a great example. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to bring up here in connection with the different types of dogmatism is, you know, this tension between philosophy and science, maybe on the one hand and religion on the other hand. And again, I, you know, I'm aware of the problems with the binaries. It's not to say all religious, you know, um, groups. It's not to say all philosophy and science groups, because clearly there are some on the one side that are dogmatic and some on the other side that are not. But this is where the tension comes up. This is an area of discussion within philosophy and others about how do science and religion connect, how do philosophy and religion connect? Because in the philosophy case, at least on paper, the eventual goal is we follow the truth wherever it may lead. And very often in the religion case, it is, these are the things we know to be true, come what may. And there is a conflict there. So, you know, in the, in the religion case, you know, the famous examples would be Copernicus and Darwin and others who were heretics and, you know, their stuff was burned and, you know, rejected and, you know, uh, believe it or not, in 2020, there are still lists of books that you cannot read. But those are the types of things we're talking about as dogmatic. Whereas in philosophy and science, again, not exclusively, there are so many examples of philosophers being dogmatic or scientists being dogmatic. Don't mean to suggest that sociologically this doesn't happen, but very often one gets the Nobel Prize or tenure or you know some sort of major award within the field for upending what we previously thought, whether that was, you know, um, Einstein or, you know, H. pylori. I mean, there, there's so many different examples. Now, you know, Schopenhauer had this good quote that I, I put here, famous philosopher um, from the 1800s, all truth passes through three phases. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, is it, it is accepted as being self-evident. So again, I'm not suggesting that in those fields, you don't have those stages of people violently opposing it. But what I am saying is that, um, 
one of the things we're trying to call attention to in this episode is the tendency of any area of endeavor, endeavor, whether it's religion or fitness or what have you, to say, these are the truths that we know. Um, and we are, it's not just that we believe these things and we want to share them, it's come what may, these aren't getting revised. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. Like if we're talking about dogmatism, yeah. um, it, that, that's really the, the issue. So that's something I thought was worthy of assessing. Yeah. It's that statement that uh, hits it home. Uh, it is um, because then with that definition, there's no place for my previous conversation of where dogma fits into fitness. Right. Cause there, cause that just closes the door to anything furthermore. Right. Right. And that, that's, that's where the, that's where, you know, I love the classification. Is it truly dogma or is it, or is it a message that comes with good intentions, you know? And if we classify it as dogma, that means the door is closed, that there's no, there's no options. Um, when I also think of, uh, you know, um, religious dogma, um, it's, a, it's a great example because there's so many human uh, uh, positives to, uh, believing and having, having this sense of certainty. There's so many positives to that. Like as a, as a human being to feel that, cause it's, a, it's an example of feeling like there's something more, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> you just slightly turn an angle and it becomes really, and like, that's the answer. The, that's the truth, you know? Um, and so you can, so religion is a great one to, to use as the example for that, um, that, and I'm, I'm well-meaning when I say this, it's very similar, similar to fitness, you know, uh, that I don't want to compare the two and being as same level, but it's a great example to see where fitness fits into that because, you know, b believing and having some certainty in fitness feels so good. It's like, it, 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 it just feels like you're part of something, right? But but you also can't say that's the answer because it closes the door to all these, uh, all these possibilities of, of what could, what could come. Right. Um, that's where we get into the massive uh, complexities of max physical potential and a lifetime of fitness and et cetera. You know, what does that look like? And the story possibly not being told, you know, in relation to that. Um, and I can also think of, uh, I could also think of, um, I would just have a sponsorship from an OPEX gym. I just got some t-shirts thrown my way from a new OPEX gym. Maybe I should bring it over and uh, kind of close and start the commercial right now and then come back. But, um, you know, your, your, uh, Schopenhauer's, uh, you know, words are just, I don't know if we need to have it as a, as like a, a meme for this podcast <laughs> because, um, uh, what, what was the order of it? Uh, um, you know, first it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, then it's accepted as being self-evident. Yeah. I mean, wow. Um, I'd like to ask you in the example of, um, uh, you know, as an example, um, you know, um, let me see if I can give one that's somewhat uncomfortable. Um, um, uh, anti-racism, the book, uh, continues to climb up uh, Amazon's uh, books, books uh, presentation. And Amazon just took uh, Shelby Steele's documentary, What Killed Michael Brown, off Amazon. Um, so if you're not aware of that to today, the, you know, this is where I think uh, dogma uh, is currently in that area of like what is, what creates a visceral reaction and what's violently opposed has a lot to do with what currently people can handle. Um, and the current example of that, meaning like, you know, in one position, it says this is, you know, what racism is, and then explains it, it says this is how you, you, you're not like that, and this is what you should do in a perspective, and it's well accepted, right? But then you have another view of someone's like, maybe you need to think about it differently, and now all of a sudden it's violently opposed. So that concept, i.e. the book that's on the New York Times bestseller list continuously, is well accepted, 
So is that, is that dogma? And I apologize if I gave an example where you're like, oh, I'm not really sure of the technicalities of it, but maybe you could pull something out of that, Robbie, to see that um, Schopenhauer's comments are so powerful that, and I think my question is indirectly inside of there too, when does it get to the point where it becomes self-evident? How, how does it move through that, you know, ridicule and, and violent opposition and then, and then end up being uh, self-evident? Yeah, I mean, I have a few thoughts there. I mean, going back to your original point, I think, you know, what you were saying about certainty, we, we can't ignore the sociological fact. And there was a professor of mine in college who made a really great point in this regard. Um, a lot of us feel better with certainty, right? It, it's, it, it's hard. I mean, it, it's, it's cool to critically think and question things and want to learn new things. But like, that's it. There, there are really hard things where you're like, I'm genuinely not sure. And like that tension where it's like, man, there are people I really respect yeah. and think are intelligent over on this one side. And then the other end's like, oh, you know, it's just like it kind of internally pulls at you. Yeah. I, I know. I mean, this is the curse of the philosopher, right? It's like yeah. this is, the, you know, in virtue of being able to critically think, sometimes you get this where you really you feel this tension. So it's it's nice to feel that certainty. Uh, and I think this is part of why just sociologically speaking, dogmatism um, so often and easily comes about and it's it's we really have to work to have it not come about we have to critically think that, that's the thing so isn't isn't the opposite isn't the other option mediocrity you're just fall you're falling prey to being just okay with seemingly thinking you're certain and it's you're just not working hard you're not willing to take the time to like well <laughs> John, John Stuart Mill had this famous question I think I mentioned in a uh, maybe on one podcast, but maybe not. But the famous question is uh, from from kind of his work on utilitarianism: Is it better to be Socrates dissatisfied or pig satisfied? Now, I mean that you know, uh, yeah. metaphorical yeah, implication. Yeah. It, it was it, he in the context he was talking about it. He was talking about it like, you know, he was saying with utilitarianism, we can't equate the good of like scratching an itch and the pleasure that comes from that with reading a book. So, yeah. but the idea there was basically something like. Um, can there be higher order pleasures? And, you know, to what you were discussing, to what you were saying, you know, yeah, that's kind of the, the downside of the other thing is, yeah, you feel that certainty, but you, you lose that expansion of, of your mind. So I, I don't know that there's a trade-off free solution. I think in one case you have critical thinking and yeah, you're going to run into some deep tensions that make you feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, and in the other, it's kind of eternal sunshine of the spotless mind yeah so um and then to your to your other point i i think this is it's i think it's an important question especially today there are discussions around in what realms of inquiry and debate should we say all ideas are open and we can discuss them and you know they're worthy of discussion mm -hmm. and what are some that we should just say no that just that's not even the discussion anymore so i mean this is a this is a argument routinely used by kind of the intelligent design crowd, and not to say that there aren't intelligent proponents on that on that side. We've mm -hmm. discussed uh, some before, but uh, there there are these questions around: in what areas of endeavor can you have multiple parties to the debate, and which is it okay? And a lot of it really it, it goes back to that to that point you were making about like when does it become dogmatic in a bad way where we're closing out these other possibilities. And then maybe when does it become dogmatic in a good way? Yeah. Where, where we're not saying, you know, um, Jews run a secret government that's running the world and control. Do you know what I mean? Like there, there are certain things that are and that and, and, and running and, you know, drawing that line can be, can be tough sometimes. I think. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sure that quote will get taken out of context by the way, and we'll get shut down. <laughs> <laughs> which will be a perfect example <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and <laughs> um yeah i think uh as a text aside douglas murray's uh madness of crowds would be a good place to go to do some reading on that particular topic of uh trying to be okay with uncertainty but also um really continuing to dig in to figure out what uh where free versus hate speech can fit in. I just use that as an example of like, 
you know, free speech and hate speech. And, you know, depending upon who you talk to or whatever your beliefs are, some would say there's a very easy definition of, of both. But, you know, if you step further and further back, you know, you're not taking into consideration how complex the human is and how they perceive those things, right? And then the power that comes within there of knowing what, uh, and I use the heavier one that you didn't mention, Robbie, but free speech and hate speech comes to my mind when you talked about that particular topic, right? Um, and I apologize again if it's, if it's too much of a burden for us to kind of like get past just simply because I said it, but it's a topic where uh, that, that's the same thing that happens. And it's like, geez, if I, you know, should I do, should I do a little bit more work when I perceive something as hate speech, right? Do I have the, can I get past just the immediate reaction of emotions? Do I have the capabilities of pausing and thinking about that comment that I'm perceiving as hate speech? And if it, what happens if I did do a little bit extra work and see that on the other side of that, it was only told to me or it was perceived as being hate speech only because how I perceived it or because a system told me that it was a particular kind of uh, communication, you know? So um, I think that's where you're, you're, you brought up a really good point as to where, uh, and it, where, and I, I use the word intensity and our, our audience can understand that, right? It's, it's, it's the intensity of the conversation. And that's why I, I put religion and fitness together because, you know, seemingly in our so, in society today, fitness is a lot less intense of a conversation, right? And, but, the, but I always like to say, well, why is that today? Like, was it 4,000 years ago, fitness was quite important in our definition of fitness, you know? And religious belief or the sun or the moon or what rain droplets were, were less, you know, there was answers to that. There was certainty to it, you know? Um, so anyways, I'm babbling, but uh, I really appreciate your, uh, your points of uh, seeing the uh, discomfort in uncertainty, in knowing what is dogma and what is uh, possibly well-intentioned beliefs. Yeah, and it's, it's tough. And I mean, going back to our discussion on liberty that we just wrapped up, you know, and, and kind of current affairs at the moment, mm. there is this um, question around free speech and, you know, uh, Facebook and Twitter at the moment are engaging in certain practices to, you know, it, it's, it's still people's right to say what they want, but uh, when should certain things be fact-checked? If there's an incitement to violence, you know, should that group be immediately shut down? <laughs> the answer, at least in that specific case, is a very strong yes. Yeah. Um, but th that you really do get these um, tough questions about, well, if there's not an incitement to violence, but it's this really crazy thing, um, where, where do you draw that? That, that really, it's, it's hard and it's uncomfortable. And yeah. again, going back to exactly what we were saying, like, I don't know that there's, you know, we used to jokingly call this in philosophy, the happy face solution, um, where it's like all benefits and no trade-offs. I don't know of a position in really any field that is all benefits and no trade-offs. Like if you want to engage in the project of critically thinking and free speech, like you are going to have these tough cases and you're going to have these things where you're feeling like, oh, I really want people to say what they believe, but ah, oh, gosh, there's this other stuff where it's like, oh my gosh, this is not okay and like there's that tension and it doesn't feel good so it's easy to be like no that's right or that's right and that's that's where you get the issue yeah yeah so what what i'm getting from this whole conversation is that in because when we're discussing you know dogma as to how it's practiced um that's where it falls into that these these challenging alignments right it's not necessarily as much about the definition of observing it because we're each we each have our own opinion on that but it's like in the practice of it, it does get down into these roads of uh, what is free speech and, and uh, what is speech that we're, like you mentioned, kind of cautious of that could, could lead to something, you know? Um, and I just keep thinking about the people that are listening to it, you know, and the responsibility that the person has when they speak of something to not only recognize what's coming out of their mouth and what it can incite, but also who are they speaking to and how do you know, or how, how you have to know how they're going to perceive that. That's where the, that's where, that's where I think. And so we'll use, it's, it's somewhat humorous, but Alex Jones is an example of that, right? So says crazy shit. Um, well, that's my perspective. <laughs> he says some crazy shit. 
I mean, he has said some shit that honestly has been crazy. That there's some facts to that shit, right? Um, facts of the fact that it was crazy, depending upon your definition of crazy. Anyways, um, so but but then he uh, but then he's deplatformed in a number of different cases, right? So there's always that great hard question inside: is you know, do you really want someone who is you know ha has a right to say those things? And my point is that you know, we, we, we all have to work together and come up with an answer to like, do we recognize that people will perceive that differently? That is a, that's a responsibility on behalf of the person that's, that's speaking about it. And that's where, it, that's where I think uh, maybe we could move the conversation towards what could be dogma, uh, just loosely, loosely given, where maybe it can be refined and it turns into being not dogma, if uh, you're saying, before you say something, you go, now, how is this going to be perceived based upon the capabilities of that audience to perceive it? You see that? Um, and that's where in my mind, where power comes in, where people like back to the early aughts and fitness, you know, it was from incorrect intentions in my belief. Um, and they saw what was going to happen. And, uh, and it was done for that reason. And they moved it in that area. And we know it to be true because they didn't want to evolve, you know? So um, anyways, um, my, my uh, speech is not uh, at the right pace of what my brain is accepting of your information. <laughs> no, that's okay. I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking just as you're, you're talking right now, I think it's, I think it's a good discussion. Um, I'm thinking and talking and maybe I should just be thinking. <laughs> um. I, I think another issue that I, I didn't list actually in our fitness discussion, but just something I thought of just as you were saying that is, um, you know, one of the things you're sometimes taught as a coach, and I remember we, we all coaches here, we took a class on like what's called, you know, I think it was called like the power of language or something like that. I was like, speak definitively, don't, 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 don't hem and haw, don't, you know, uh, well, maybe this and maybe that. And, um, I think there's a certain extent to it. And, and, you know, there are virtues to that, especially when you're trying to convey a point. But I think there's a certain extent to which, like, the market and sociologically speaking, like, people want that, like, well, is whey protein good or bad? Is CrossFit good or bad? Like that binary. They want that. They want that certainty. And, like, when I, you know, when you say context matters or when I hem and haw, I'm like, well, it depends. Who are we talking about? And, like, again, going back to that notion of, like, that, that tension. People don't like that tension. Like, what is definitively right for me now fitness wise or nutrition wise or what have you and there's that there's that pull and going back to that point you were asking about like how is the person going to take what I tell them you know if I tell them whey protein is good they're gonna say well whey protein is you know it, yeah that's it, that's what you should be having I should go out and buy some but if I say well for this person in this context and has this benefit and you don't really need it and what did you even say to me right now? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're like, why don't I even ask oh, you the what question? you're saying is protein. <laughs> so what you're saying, I should, I should get some of that cinnamon milkshake right now. Is that what you're saying? I need to get some of that, you know, uh, Cinnabon flavored, uh, yeah. protein. So that's, yeah, that's after the five minute, after the five minute explanation. Right. And that, that's one of the things we run into, I think, sociologically and why it's so hard. And again, why I think, you know, there is a certain extent to which with the critical thinking we're fighting the good fight is that there's this very deep sociological tendency, not just to want to believe something with certainty for ourselves, but to also ask in the health and fitness realm for this, well, is it good or bad? Which one is it? I want the certainty. I want the answer. Yeah. And it, it's, it's not just the time thing. Like part of it's the time thing. Like I'm busy. I got stuff to do, but it is also that like, just tell me, I don't want the tension. And, yeah. and that, that's something we have to grapple with. Yeah. Yep. Oh man. Yep. <laughs> um, and just because we, we can make it uh, that, or I just want to let everyone know that I'm aware of it too. Um, there is a big challenge for uh, you and I, Robbie, as well as listeners and people who are participating in fitness today. Um, there's not a lot of space uh, for that. Um, not a lot of people talk about uh, creating space and time to think about those things. Uh, the system sure as shit doesn't support it. You know, like it's not well accepted that every fitness coach dedicates two hours of their afternoon for reflection, a reflection period. 
you know what I mean? Like, and we'll pause at that as, as, you know, as a connection to like the lack of reflection period that coaches have, but I'm talking about like, you know, re reading a low intense book or, uh, or just like thinking, thinking about these, these big issues, you know, we're, that's not a part of it. So I'm saying this to, to also make you recognize how hard it is to move towards taking time to critically think, listen, listening to long dialogue, right? Pausing this podcast and just going like, you know, just taking a second and thinking about that and going, man, if I, if I just put in my hands the example of uh, whey protein shakes, right? Good or bad, just, but just put it in your hands as a practice, right? And just be like, you know, the, the, and then put different clients in there, you know, and then, and then see all the effort that goes into trying to find the right answer there and the pluses and the minuses of it. Um, but I just don't think there's a lot of time for that. And, uh, and we want to get those and it's well accepted, Robbie, that people should get an answer within 10 seconds, you know? Um, so yeah, just want to make aware that it's, it's challenging. It's, and, uh, and that it's not getting easier. You know, nothing is pointing towards it being, you know, easier. Uh, we're not, we're not going back to the farms and, and, uh, you know, social media is not dropping down and communication is still virtual, you know, so, you know, it's not moving towards that. No. And I, I was just, I was preparing, um, intention and fitness part two for release next week. And there was a, there was a point in there you were making, um, I thought was good. It was basically when, when you encounter this pain or difficulty, it's, it can be a sign that you're on the right track. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of like the, the James clear point in atomic habits, which is really, I mean, that, that goes back a long time. I mean, in any tradition of Kung Fu or learning or anything, right. It's, it's the, the, the long struggle that, that uncertainty, that, that, um, that challenge that, that, that is what usually leads towards better, more worthwhile things. And the, you know, I want the sound bite stuff is, is generally not. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about um, dogmatism being good or bad. And then, you know, maybe some of the questions we were asking up front about um, how we can maybe redefine dogmatism or talk about a way in which it might even be good yeah. in, in yeah. fitness. So yeah. um, I think just to start, just to give some people some sense of why you might view dogmatism as, as a vice, um, there there are some reasons practically speaking why you might think this, but there's also some that are kind of intrinsic to the very attitude itself. So practically speaking, you know, it's very often accompanied by ignorance, right? We all know this, that those that are the most sure of themselves tend to be the ones who uh, know the least. Um, and again, we're, we're, we'll come to this in the discussion. It, it doesn't mean sure in the sense of like, you have lots of evidence behind it and you're willing to revise it, but there's no contrary evidence. Like it's not, it's not that, it's like you, you know, very often those are the people who don't have much evidence and they're just banging their fist. Um, it can lead to more religious and political repression. So we've seen this obviously with people of, of color and religious minorities and LGBTQ. Um, and it just closes off us off intellectually to different possibilities. You know, people didn't think that space and time were malleable. Mm -hmm. uh, turns out they are. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that led to Einstein's uh, discovery. Um, same thing with the, you know, we thought the sun rotated around the earth and it turns out that's not true. So it just closes you what? off. Just a second. <laughs> Speaking of things where like, you were asking like, when does it become self-evident? I, I feel like, I hope like we've reached that point where that's self-evident or like as self-evident as we're going to get without the 0.03% of people yeah. who have a Facebook group about how that's not yeah. the case on yeah. yeah or young kids right like my, i explained to my 11 year old just i remember a couple of years ago um it's like the sun doesn't set and she's like what you know so depends upon your brain size and age too right and that that's the other tension that um can sometimes lead to dogmatism i guess where the propensity is there there are all these appearances that appear to lead in a certain direction and that's a famous dichotomy in philosophy, appearance and reality, right? Yeah. The appearances very often lead to, um, not always, but sometimes um, mistaken beliefs. But then when you do that deeper delve into things, you can 
see the reality. Yeah. Um, but you might ask, why is dogmatism in and of itself bad, aside from what it might lead to? So this, this you know, this is a so-so argument in philosophy to say, well, it leads to this and leads to that. I mean, it, it, it can be useful, but you gotta be careful with that argument. Sometimes you have to talk about why the thing is not so good in itself. So I think there are three facts here that, that show us why dogmatism is most likely an epistemological vice. Uh, we're finite beings, both spatially and temporally. We exist in a particular time, on a particular planet, in a particular country. Um, we have limited epistemological capabilities. Like we've accomplished a lot of stuff, but we, as far as we know, have five senses. <laughs> Those don't have access to everything. We can't um, see x-rays with our bare eyes. You know, we, we're not capable, capable of echolocation with our current set of senses. Um, so we just have access to limited things. And then probably the biggest one we thought we've known to be true, both in science and many other endeavors, um, has turned out to be wrong and comically so in a lot of cases. So those are all facts. Now, if we want to inject a value in there, we could say something like, given the, various, uh, the very obvious fallibility of human beings, it would seem not just ignorant, but epistemically irresponsible to be dogmatic. So that's, that's kind of where we get there. So I'll pause there. Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, it's just an, it's a beautiful coloring of our previous commentary on where, you know, there, if you, there are some observed things that are facts in fitness and all layers in the fitness area. And then when, you know, and it actually is, you know, unsafe <laughs> when you don't apply some of those real things for people. And again, it goes back to the intensity argument, not intensity of how hard I'm working out, but the intensity of the concept, meaning, you know, people like, well, James, you know, who fucking cares? People are moving, intense activity, music, bah, you know, stop writing about it, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you're not the one rehabbing those people or the coaches. So how intense is it to you? You don't fucking care. You're not a part of it. So you see, from my perspective, is that it is intense, intense in the argument because it leads to, you know, it leads to a downhill spiral. You know, it doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. And so uh, I, I just like the way you, you know, laid that out because it colored our argument as to our conversation as to where it comes into dogma in fitness. You know, there's this, in the end, we just got to be okay with uh, uh, uncertainty, but it doesn't, and it, you know, I was thinking about too, as you're saying it is, you know, I, we could say that, uh, uh, well, maybe you could let me know, you know, people uh, moving every day, that that connects them to him being able to move every day that allows them to, to move every day for 22,000 times in a lifetime that allows them to continually work towards optimal expression you know uh, could be dogma that's my that's you know because the what i said before i said could be dogma that's my view like my view is that people should continually try to express themselves every day to work towards what optimum is. And then if you work, you know, if you're, if you're right in your pathway, you'll do this forever. If you're doing it incorrectly, you won't do it forever. You know, it, so it like, it, it works itself into the idea of consistency and sustainability, you know? So Robbie, is that dogma? Um, or how does that, how does that differ from my points of the other one, which is the intense argument of like, well, you know, just, you you gotta you gotta get in there and work hard because humans you know are just not tough enough today. So you gotta work hard and struggle and suffer in order to reach salvation. You know. So what's your what's your thoughts on that? Because both can be perceived as being dogmatic statements. No, I think that's a great question. It just made me think a little bit more deeply about um, something that I think hopefully will answer answer that question. So. Uh, I, I think this is a genuine thing that we encounter in lots of different areas of inquiry, right? Where we're like, well, I firmly believe one set of things and they firmly believe one set of things, but they're the ones being dogmatic and I'm, I'm not. Like, what do I do here? Again, this tension. So here's, I think, a way to very often get around it, but maybe not always. And I'll, I'll give the caveat. In order to not be dogmatic, the, 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 the antidote for dogmatism is, is, is critical thinking and, and reason and rationality. And 
being in what's sometimes called the space of reason. So in the example you gave of the fitness situation where you have those things that you just outlined that you believe, mm -hmm. and over here we've got the intense, you know, listen to the music, doing the wad, camp. You each, if you're not being dogmatic, should be able to engage in a discussion where one lobs a reason across the net and the other lobs another reason across the net and should be able to have that rational discussion. But very often what happens in the case of one side, whether it's, you know, flat earthers or what have you, is they're like, space of reasons, nope, I'm a, I'm a step out. I'm no longer engaging in that because your reasons don't, don't count anymore. So I think someone who believes the high intensity model is really the way to light in the truth, you better be able to put up some reasons besides Greg Glassman said so, or we've been doing this for the past 20 years. And that, that's, that to me is the key. Yeah. Is that, you know, for what you were outlining, you know, I know because I've heard you say it many times that you do have reasons behind that. Now, the reason that's not a way to get out of all situations where you run into that is because sometimes even after the discussion about different reasons that you're lobbing back and forth, it comes down to fundamentally incompatible values. So very often you can resolve the discussion because you realize, oh, on this one side, there weren't very good reasons. Yeah. They're just like, I did it because yeah. someone else said so. Yeah. But you can get back to what we were talking about last time with Liberty about are there things that are intrinsically good and what are those things? Is it health and longevity? Mm -hmm. Or is competitiveness and performance, things like that. Yeah. So it's not a perfect out, but I would say in more cases than not, the party to the debate that's like, I'm sidestepping this. I'm not engaging in debate. I'm just doing it because someone said to, said so. Yeah. That's how you can tell because they don't have yeah. reasons to support what they're believing. Yeah, yeah. Well, we need to get on stage. <laughs> we need, we need to invite the zealots to the party, Robbie. <laughs> you can be the moderator, okay? You can be uh, you can be Brett Weinstein and. And uh, I'll take Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson and we'll flip flop the, and it'll be a facts values uh, conversation on fitness. How about that? Yeah. I mean, I honestly, you know, I think that would be awesome. I mean, I, I saw, you know, your, I actually think this would be a cool discussion depending on who it is, but like I saw your Instagram story the other day, you know, uh, Chris Beeler, uh, you know, is intensity the most important or volume? Like that's a legit, you know, you're, are, are two people with, you know, lots of experience in the fitness realm, like, let's put up those reasons. Do you know what I mean? Let's, let's put up those reasons. And you, um, I think in something like a, you know, I'm sure you've seen this with Chris Kresser on Joe Rogan or in other things like yeah. where, you, where you get kind of the, the, the vegan meat eater debate, you, you do get a lot of the science, but you do get a lot of this value question. I think in the fitness case, there will still be those values that are at play, but I, th and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I feel like to a much larger extent, it will be, you'll, you'll get less of that kind of like visceral, like, yeah. So yeah. That's, that's, that's what I would think there. I think something like that would be great. And if someone believes that intensity is really the way to go, they should be able to put up reasons. Yeah, for sure. Withstand scrutiny. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just like, uh, well, I, I, yeah, I think uh, the fitness one would garner uh, some uh, visceral reactions. It depends upon how meaningful the conversation is to people. Um, and I would say, um, that's just, well, I know we're, I know we're going to cover it down the road, but that's an interesting thing as to why insider nutrition, it's that way, because I generally lean up against the same kind of, let's call it a big bucket of reasons as to why, um, you know, people, um, uh, could be having uh, various different kinds of meat throughout their life. And, um, and I, I just see it the same way. So anyways, that, that's a good, that's a good, uh, it's a good example to, uh, you know, and give people a little sneak uh, preview of us getting into that area. Yeah, but I would say the way practically for both coaches and people listening to just suss this out is you should be able to give reasons for what you believe. And this actually, this takes place a lot in uh, philosophy within uh, the, um, the debates about how much religion should influence politics or not. There's a debate between a philosopher named John Rawls and another named Nicholas Wolterstorff. But basically the headline is that one of the main points of the debate is you need to give reasons to your other side that they themselves can understand. 
you know, economic data, historical data, sociological data, like things that are publicly available. You saying, well, uh, the Bible says this, or Judaism says, you know what I mean? Like things that are conversation stoppers where you can't gain any more traction. Mm-hmm. That's where you run into issue. And I think it, it's, it's a similar thing with the dogmatism conversation where in order for you to tell, are you yourself being dogmatic in the situation or is the other side engage in that debate? If they lodge, lodge a reasonable uh, objection against your view, come up with some reasons. Yeah. And if yeah. then you lodge a reasonable objection against their view, see what they do. Do they come back with reasons or do they say, no, nope, I'm going to bang my fist and I'm right. Sorry, this is over. Yeah. 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 That's really good, man. Reason or space of reasons. Yeah. They got to be able to provide a space of reasons. Um, just to push our folks over to, again, a, uh, a challenging conversation where I think both sides come to a lot of great discussion conversation is, um, uh, Coleman Hughes and Ta-Nehisi, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Mr. Coates, I apologize for the name, but uh, on reparations um, and reparations from slavery. Um, I, that's a really, it, it is, it's not, it's not vehemently opposed. The conversation is, you know, of course, don't read through the YouTube comments, but uh, just listen, listen to those really, you know, positive gentlemen really honestly speak from their heart on like, what their beliefs are. And they, they lay out a whole bunch of things that are, are really strong. So you don't have this like lopsided, listen, I'm not willing to, not willing to talk about that. There's a lot of like really good things on either side, just to kind of take us out of the fitness, you know, fitness realm. And for those who are not in North America, even to understand that story of slavery and reparations and the conversation around it is still a really good storyline of, of, you know, just, you know, getting a deeper um, perspective of the human experience. And it's very complex, but it's still, to, your, to my point, both offer this deep space of reason for their, you know, their, their thought, right? Um, and then there's others that uh, have the same belief as these two individuals, but uh, they don't have the courage or the, the confidence or the opportunity to just sit back and ask some hard questions and like to, to go back and forth, you know? So anyways, sorry for, uh, for that as a tangent, but it'll, and I'd like all the listeners to go and do that research and then say, now where are my beliefs in fitness on that? You know, and, and, and uh, take a low intense topic. What I think, think society is, is, is still fitness, a low intense topic and go, where are there those dogmatic beliefs in it? And why can't we get to a point where, you know, the discussion and take names out of it, you know, not me and not Chris Spieler, but two different beliefs in fitness. And why can't we have those people have those discussions like that? You know, so people can make decisions and then, and then just go back and go, well, I believe that because these are my values. Like, this is what I, this is just what I believe. Right. And then you can just do with it as you wish, but at least there's some truths and shit that's outlined out of what they proposed, you know, in that conversation. So hopefully you can do the same thing inside of fitness. And then recognize very quickly. And this is what I always want people, not just from these calls, but my coaches to get. I want you to leave the conversation and be able to go out there, right? And have an open mind and navigate this thing. And then, and then at the time where it's necessary, just go, just a second now. Just a second. Let's, let's be really careful on the statement you just made or what came out of my mouth or what we claim to be true, right? Um, and that, that's what we're looking for you to do with it. And then you can classify if you want, that's, that's dogma, you know, that right there, you know, and this is why, because it doesn't, it closes the door, you know, it's like, and it's not, the door is not closed. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, um, openness there. So thank you for that space of reasons. Um, and you know, shutting the door as the being the defining aspect of it. Those are two highlighting moments for me today. That was really helpful for that. No, and thank you. I mean, I think that's an excellent number of points that you made there, but I think, you know, like you were mentioning sociologically, the extent to which two people are able to engage calmly in a discussion rather than in an adversarial banging the table manner yeah. to acknowledge that the other person, even though they may disagree, 
there can be rational disagreement. Again, going back to this point of underdetermination where we can all be presented with the exact same evidence and yet there can be different rational interpretations of that data and just, just that aspect of being willing to accept that you may be wrong, which is, which is uncomfortable. You may have to revise your beliefs, but that, that's a, usually that, that, that discussion that you just mentioned, um, you know, it, it sounds like the two parties in the debate or in the discussion, you know, were rashly engaged in deep conversation in such a way that they respected each other and understood each other's reasons. And it wasn't, you know, a cable news show shouting match where yeah. there's no reasonable discussion and people aren't accepting that they could be wrong or that the other person has any value. They're just wrong and evil. Do you know what I mean? So that, that's, that's another way to kind of get at that dogmatism. Yeah, but again, what uh, I'm sorry what I'm extracting from that, I apologize for it, is because this is what I'm seeing is that I really can't see a space that's ever going to uh, evolve in, in fitness. I really can't see that ever being like, you know, everyone's listening and there's two individuals just, or two individuals or two groups just like having an honest back and forth conversation. I can't see it. I think we got to get you on Rogan with, well, whoever the other interlo interlocutor is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think we gotta have a, a Chris Cresser style uh, yeah. where, where you're one side and then that, that'll be the closest to a form that's big enough within our realm of the woods yeah yeah but. yeah all right so what do you what do you think for today you want to uh, man I thought this was gonna be one episode but we got we got we got a lot to say so um, I guess we can discuss it more, but maybe we, maybe we come back to some more of these fitness questions. Cause I think that original one that you asked about, could there be a positive use for dogma or what, maybe not the come what may version, but the positive assertion, could there be a use for that? I think there's still a, a good question to be had there. So. Yeah, there is. Um, because, uh, there's, you know, there's always the, I don't know if it falls into that category, but it's the common question you get from coaches like, you know, even though even though they don't have the correct intention and James and these clients don't want to sign up for a 25 year program. Um, is it really that bad that they're going unconsciously about this? Isn't it possible that it'll transform their brains in a year and they'll become woke to it? Hey, okay. Got this, you know um, you know, I think that's, and you know what, what they were, what the way they answered to that client from the get go was dogma, right? It's like, Oh, so what am I going to do here? Oh, you're going to lose weight and do intensity and change your life, you know, um, and, which is a statement, right? It's a dogmatic statement. And, uh, and by background, they were like, eh, I'm just, just kind of letting them, you know, run through the woods and bang into a tree. And then I'll catch them and be like, listen, so let me change up that statement from the original. So, and that, that's a good question that I get from a lot of coaches, right? Um, I, uh, <laughs> I ironically answer it in a, in probably a dogmatic fashion in terms of having to deal with that on scale. <laughs> it's just exhausting. So why not? Uh, so if you just with one person, it's like, yeah, it's fine. Uh, try doing that with 80 people over a two year period. I mean, you will, you'll burn the house down um, or like, you know, uh, rip your CCP book in half or something. I don't know. Or pound on the keys on a CCP call or, <laughs> So I'm not sure if I'm just starting off on that conversation of trying to answer that right now or dogma and fitness. And I, it's up to you. I mean, I, if, if you have time, I have time. I, I, it's really up to you. How, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Let's, let's jam on a little bit. Cause I think that's uh, am I, am I right? That that's probably that enters into yeah. that. Like, yeah. 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 I, I, so I think a relevant question here that I think plays into this and can get us some deeper thought on it is, you know, in, in, in my outline, I had, you know, I think for both of us, cards on the table, both of us think dogma is traditionally defined, come what may, isn't a good thing. Like, I don't think we're saying something particularly controversial there. But one of the examples I gave of where dogma may, may in a redefined kind of potential way would be dogma may be useful. You know, I don't personally have kids. Uh, I know you do, and I, but I, I know from uh, other people that, you know, sometimes you just gotta be like, don't cross the road. Do you know what I mean? Like or eat your broccoli. Uh, and that comes with the promissory note of like, eventually you'll understand the reasons. And then the question there becomes in relation to what you were just saying, are we treating adults like 
kids by doing this method of like, well, they're unconsciously engaging in this stuff. I'm going to let them bump against the walls. And then like a year or two later, they'll come to me and they'll say, Oh, I, I get it now. Yeah. You know, um, Mac 10 and, uh, you know, some, <laughs> some, some gain and I'm, I'm good to go. I don't need the intensity. Yep. So I, I think that's, that's really an interesting question is like, is that okay? Is that not okay? Uh, yeah. Thoughts there. Yeah, I don't know, uh, but you we bring up some good uh, question and I'm mulling over in my head based upon those examples. I'm also thinking about the ch children thing. The, uh, you know, my, my counterpoint to that would be that though, uh, um, again, it comes down to you recognizing who's receiving the information. That's a responsibility on the person that's doing it. So to the children thing, you know, don't cross throat, eat your broccoli, um, you know, um, even a more serious one of like your prepubescent and you, you should have these natural instincts to change up your self perception and feel differently in different bodies and about gender and sex and identity and et cetera. This is a normal occurrence of, of, you know, and the reason why I mentioned that is that, um, that's, that's a really serious, you know, area of discussion today in my world anyways, and in parenting world is that, you know, eight to 10 year olds, uh, having these regular normal human changes that are happening that is, as an adult perspective is like, Oh, you feel that way? Go ahead. You know, you can, you can go see the doctor and, and start changing up your identity based upon how you're feeling, you know? And so that, that's a, that's a real, that's a real serious repercussion for, for the previous thing you had talked about. Um, and I think it's parallel to, to, to coming back to, again, taking the responsibility of saying, as this comes out of my mouth, you know, who's receiving this information and how are they going to receive it? Like, what, what, did, they what did they have as, as uh, faculties to, to get that? Um, and if you're like, well, James, a lot of people, even as adults, don't get that, then don't fucking say it if you know that they will not get it. Meaning... You know, don't, don't, don't make the, you know, don't be afraid of, of saying the dogmatic statement <laughs> if you know it to be right for them. But why are you saying it is because, you know, they can't like sit back and, hmm, you know, let me, let me think about that for a second. Right. Um, so the pers you raise a couple of great ones there for prescription to children. Um, that's where it comes back to my sayings. Be a fucking adult about it. Like, Meaning, take the responsibility that you're not going to say, you're going to say, don't cross the road, because you know they can't, like, ruminate on if it's good or not. It's, they, they, they don't have the faculties to think about those abstract, you know, things. They don't know what three days is going to bring, right? <laughs> so, it's like in fitness, I mean, if, if they're adults, this is where I go always, is like, no, you tell them. You say, like, this is what I believe, right? You're not going to, to my point, going back to what I said earlier, you're not going to pull the veil over them. We're like, ah, down the road, we'll, we'll figure it out. Like, no, as an adult, they, and, and as you, as an adult, when you're speaking back and forth, make the assumption, and you can put people on a continuum of what consciousness would be or fitness, intelligence, et cetera, but, you know, make, make the assumption that they, they have to get it. So it doesn't become doesn't become a question if they got to eat broccoli versus Doritos, right? It's like, yeah, but their calories, like, oh my gosh, like, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to work that around with you, right? But imagine having that with my daughter, right? At 11, broccoli or Doritos, like, think that she's gonna have a base of reason for that? I mean, come on, come on, right? Um, I, I'm not saying come on, like, Robbie, don't even ask that question. I mean, it's like, just think about that, right? Uh, so th those are the things that, go through my mind on it is maybe you could suss that out for me. Like, why am I finding that so important? And can you create some structure or system thinking to that, Robbie, of being responsible for knowing who's receiving the information when you're making a dogmatic statement? Yeah, no, and I, I'm, I'm largely in agreement with what you said. I mean, I, and it goes back to what we were discussing in the Liberty and Fitness episode where we were saying, look, you know, we, we agree to make laws about kids wearing bike helmets and other things and not engage, you know, they can't smoke cigarettes. But once you reach the age of 18, like going back to your point about certain faculties, the idea is unless there's some sort of major cognitive impairment, we all have a base level of reason. We can understand what the other person's saying and have some, have some critical thinking about it. So I think the point you made about thinking about who you're speaking to 
makes a lot of sense. And, that, and that, that's why as adults, we, we shouldn't be treating them like, like children and treating them as though they, they are not capable. The one asterisk I do run into there, I mean, I, I, I am largely in agreement in the ideal uh, and practically I do run into this as a, a coach and Brandon and I discuss it a lot. Man, there's a spectrum of critical thinking, um, <laughs> as I'm sure you know. And, you know, sometimes I, I, I do wonder about that. It's not quite an ends justify the means question because that comes off very, well, it is Machiavellian, but like, you know, we're not, we're not doing something nefarious here, but like, sometimes I do wonder, it's like, sometimes when you do the little bits and pieces, like people do recognize what they, you know, oh, I should have been doing that. But like, if yeah. you told them up front, they wouldn't quite get it. Yeah. But that's not, that's not always the case. So that's the only asterisk I practically run into and I wonder about is that if you, if you try telling them off the bat, which boy, have I many different times only to be like, you know, there's somewhere they get it, but not where they don't. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the only place where practically I run into it. But um, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts there. Oh man, so much. It goes back to our statements last time in Liberty of just, you know, just saying, just shut up and do what I tell you. <laughs> We're going to end the dogmatism episode, going back to the dogmatism. <laughs> so what you're saying is, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You can't handle the truth, so you just need to get out there. <laughs> you know? yeah. and that's, that's what I'm saying. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm probably, as I age, a little less patient with the with the awareness of where people lie on their, on their uh, ability to understand those concepts. Yeah. Um, you know, but, and I'm just being honest with you, maybe, maybe time does get to that point, right? Uh, you turn into a curmudgeon like myself uh, in fitness based upon that. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's though, not because I'm uh, impatient, maybe I want to nudge uh, with correct intentions. You know, so maybe, maybe the cajoling, cajoling uh, back and forth, eh, just think about this a little bit, get a little nuggets and wait nine months. Maybe that's futile. That's what I want to, I want us to think. Maybe that's futile. Maybe, maybe people have the opportunity. Or I like to say you can change people's perspectives through language by saying, you know, saying things like, is it possible? Is it possible that what you thought to be true is actually not not true? Take a second. And if they go, yeah, I guess it is possible. Then is it possible that a lot of those things that you think you're supposed to be doing this for are not real? And then now all of a sudden you see the cards start to change. So that just took me 20 seconds to do that, right? Yeah. You now very easy for me on, on a show and a soundbite right. like that to be able to do it, but. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'm definitely a believer in the language and the experience. And then, it, and then what gets into this too, Robbie, is, is expertise, right? And, uh, and uh, you know, the mastery of coaching. We've talked about this before, right? Like, you know, under the highest definition, it probably takes, you know, 20 years of experience and you need to be 40 to 50 years of age for you to be at this, you know, mastery level of coach to really affect people on the, on the deepest level, right? Because all your tools are efficient and do you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. um, and, and a 21 year old can't just take my sound bite and just start with someone on that. Now they can't just like take that and do it, you know? So that falls into being an area of an issue here as well. Um, as well as the fitness landscape, like how fitness is offered and how it's delivered and, and the madness in there, there's no answer to that. What is fitness? Gosh, I don't know what fitness is. You know, what is CrossFit? I don't know what CrossFit is. Like it, it's just, a. Uh, so much subjective uh, realism confuses it. <laughs> yeah, the tension that you come back to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we're there's... Aware of the tension. Sorry, what was that? We're aware of the tension. That's, it's, yeah. that's, the, that's the learning. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I've definitely seen it where, and I'm sure you've seen it too, where some people start out in kind of that that mold of the high intensity stuff and they i mean many many coaches eventually turn to opex right like they started they started on that and like oh yeah. kind of you know I, I realized stuff didn't 
um, stuff isn't right within this model that I'm going to. But, but I think to your point, there, there are a lot of people who enter that model uh, and you think they're going to come out and they just, they're just on the hamster wheel. They're searching for the next dopamine hit, next, next supplement. Um, so it's, it's that tough thing of how, how and when do you hit them with the truth? How and when do you, because like we were discussing before, like, this is a real sociological and psychological fact. People don't like their worldview questioned and you can do it, but it's like inception. You gotta, it, it's a, it's a real mission to really try and change that. So when, when do you bring that up? And, um, and most don't like hard work either. I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. With you. It's not within us to like go and strive every day, you know, to really push our resources and push up against our resources, you know? Um, Lord knows we're not, we're not building more resources and more energy to, to move towards that every day. We don't fuel ourselves for that. That's not our intentions of it. Um, also, I'd like to change, I'm saying it right now so we can change our language on it. Um, or I'm not saying that you should as well, but you mentioned it earlier, how we at OPEX change the perspective of people who get into the, the, fit, the, the high intensity fitness model. I think we need to start calling it um, the uh, unconscious intention model. Okay. So their intentions are incorrect. It's, and the practice of it may not always be high intensity fitness, right? It may be whatever they're choosing to be their dose response. It's just that we see a lot of the, the high intensity being the thing that they're going after, right? For multiple reasons of dopamine responses and whatever they're trying to look for on that. Um, but it's the, the, it's the behaviors that really are the that's the issue there, right? It's the intentions are incorrectly aligned as to why they're doing it. And we just want to say, all we're asking is you just think about why you're doing it. And when you think you've gotten to that answer, you haven't. You haven't. You think you know, but you don't know. You don't know. And are you okay with that? No, I'm not okay with it. That's okay. Let's keep going. And this is where it comes into like have being open <laughs> and having a business and continuing to have operate. And, uh, but do you, and my point is I always go back to that. It's like when you start doing those 50, 60, 70 people, it's, it's, uh, what I make a lot of people aware of. And that's very easy for me to say is that, um, and I could just see people's like eyes shutting down when I say this, but I say you could be, you know, 80% of the people that surround you, um, are all, are all there for the wrong reasons. Right. And people's worlds are just like, Oh gosh, you know, how do I leave this call and remedy that tomorrow? Right. I mean, and then I just say, listen, you're not going to remedy that tomorrow, but I don't want you to not know this now. <laughs> I don't want you to really say, oh, no, 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 <laughs> That's not the case. Like, well, answer these questions, right? Do they come in for this? Do they come in for this? Do they come in for this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I think a lot of the reason why coaches want to resolve that now goes back to, you know, that tension we were talking about. You don't want that, that tension. You don't want that, but that's, that kind of is what comes along with hard work, whether it's in yeah. fitness or critical thinking or what have you, is this, that, that progression. One other thing you made me think of that I, I guess I hadn't really, it, it wasn't conscious, but uh, you know, we were trying to draw distinctions between how you know when you're being dogmatic versus not dogmatic and you're talking about, you know, the distinction between um, OPEX and, you know, certain practices within fitness isn't necessarily the high intensity model, but unconscious intention versus conscious. When you said that, it made me think it's very hard to be consciously dogmatic. Yeah. It's very easy to be unconsciously dogmatic. So when we're thinking about this, yep. you know, th that's another way you can tell. Now, the tricky part, of course, is, um, I'm sure you've seen that meme uh, being stupid is like being dead. It's not a problem for you. It's a problem for everyone else. <laughs> like you don't know you're unconscious. <laughs> so that's kind of the issue, but that, that is a way to distinguish uh, between, you know, dogmatism and not is like, it, it, it's very, very difficult to be consciously dogmatic just insofar as you are aware and you bring that awareness of things, but it is very easy to be unconsciously dogmatic. Yeah. So how do we, uh, how do we solve for that? How do, you know, does it come from an outside source? How do we, how do we solve for that unconscious dogmatism inside of fitness? I think there are a few different ways. I mean, education is kind of the easy, you know, toss it in the ring answer, which, which is a good one. But I think to a large extent, I mean, not to toot our own horn because there are lots of other people doing this, but 
critical thinking that like, you know, sliding the red pill over and like, oh God, that's, oh man, that's a horrible one. And the, you, you know, you know where that ties into like people totally took that and yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. By the way, one of my favorite movies of all time and uh, I believe it was Lana Wachowski said fuck you to uh, <laughs> the two people who like tried to appropriate that in like a not good way. But anyway, complete aside. Um, but, but the idea being that like you, you give uh, people the, the seeds of critical thinking that hopefully eventually blossom into deeper thought about stuff. stuff. Um, that, that's, that's the only way I currently see forward is to, or one of the main ways I see forward is to, you know, give people these questions and get them to deeply think. And then that's how you raise consciousness. But if the information is, is 30 X and everyone's trying to garner attention on even the information, um, how does it move? How does it move that way? Like if we're going to put this into a prescription, how does it move to, you know, collectively or generally people getting enough space and time just to kind of sit and critically think, I mean, I'm just not, uh, I just want to be aware of our own, you know, my own, well, my own, sorry, my own uh, beliefs. Um, you know, I got a, I got a fairly good uh, pulse on what, how I see things, but that's not how everyone else sees it um, as it should be. But uh, I, you know, I'm just trying to think of so many different examples and just come up with that one avatar, right? The unconscious user. And then the coach now waking up to that and going, you know, how do we, how do, how do they now approach that with the user in fitness, right? How do, how do they, and I'm just not, I'm not seeing it, you know, I'm not seeing it, uh, I'm not seeing, I'm seeing more participation in a virtual world, a generation now in 15 years, that entire generation thinks that that is communication, whether you you know, there's positive and negatives, but that, that is communication. Um, you know, I'm just not seeing it uh, move, move in that direction. Maybe not. I mean, I think practically speaking, you, you bring up a good point, which is, okay, so we say critical thinking is the way to start this thing off and get the ball rolling, but do people even have enough time, practically speaking, to, you know, culture says, you know, sleep when you're dead, especially our culture, and, you know, there's very little time for reflections and that's why sound bites and certainty yeah so I, I agree with you from that a practical like ground level perspective we need to even create the the seeds the the soil in which critical thinking can can grow and that is that is a big um project yeah like my point i made on uh um children a while back you know like uh philosophy and uh economics and uh physical literacy is not taught in grade three or grade four or grade five anymore you know and the immediate the immediate response to that is like That's stupid why would you want to teach a, a five-year-old about uh you know physical autonomy and uh and uh meditation and contemplation and uh, a checkbook that's the dumbest thing ever it's like do you know what's severely missing in their development that's resulting in this hand holding and cajoling for long period of life now is the fact that they weren't taught these things, you know? So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a deep one. It's a, yeah. it's, it's deep that we can't get deep or it's deep that we're not respecting pause and reflection to your point, you know, die when you're sorry, sleep when you're dead, et cetera. Um, that's a, that's a reality. Um, anyways, it's just, it's just a, probably the seventh time we've said it in different ways you know it just exists and what are you going to do about it you know you're gonna you're gonna get inspired to make any dent with your next client are you going to be uh are you going to now just shut this down and be like man eh, you know it's crazy talk i don't see it in my ecosystem um you know so hey it's out there so you can't unknow it what you want to do about it is it's up to you, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, I personally think, you know, I, it, it's hard to know how the future is going to turn out, but I, I mean, the place that gives me hope for this type of stuff is 
some of my one-on-one interactions with clients where they do through experience come to realizations, whether it's nutrition or it's like, Oh, I thought I had to count calories. It's like, no, just like chew your food and eat real whole food and all the rest of that stuff or fitness where it's like, Oh, I thought I had to be climbing ropes and flipping tires. Like, Oh no, this is actually, you know I mean? Those experiences, but also history is really instructive. Not much stays too constant for too long. So I feel like, yes, even though that is our current situation, yes, it is really sad that the first philosophy class I ever took was in college. And that is the case for most people these days. Uh, And that largely, as I'm sure you know, has to do with historically how schools were set up to be, you know, you just do what we tell you. Um, But I guess my somewhat cautiously optimistic, potentially point of view is, um, even that method of schooling isn't that old, (laughs) historically speaking, and it can change. It'll just, it'll be like getting the Titanic to do a U-turn, but it can change. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We'll see. We'll see. Hopefully if there's some young folks on here that are, um, going to become parents, then, you know, I wish you well. And maybe you're thinking about some of these things now for some of your decisions for your children and where they're educated and what it looks like. And, you know, think big picture of that, you know, in 30 years, you know, we talk loosely cliche commentary, you know, you just hear from the higher ups, which are generally just virtue signaling bullshit, but it's like, we got to think about our future generation, you know, but really think about that. You know what, what, cause that, that hits close to home when we start thinking about things um, like, uh, you know, our future clients or who you want inside the fitness complex in 15 years, right? Some of the actions you make may help that because you could, you could help an adult to at 23 who becomes a parent at 25, who at 33 are teaching their children and they're teaching their children and their children's friends, you know? Um, and, and you've, you know, affected, you know, a number of people really positively just because you now know around those things on, uh, on fitness practice and, and uh, what we know to be true, you know? Right. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, that's good. We still have a little bit more. So, uh, probably for another time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll chat with you, uh, after the call, we'll see where we want to head from here, but I think that was a good first discussion on it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I learned a lot. And that's all that matters.